if you really want it, just go do it. Like, stop talking, go do. And anything can be done. You, you know, I think one of the coolest things about entrepreneurship is watching people grow. You one day you may be, you know, a, a, a lower on the totem pole, and then ten years later you're you're a king somewhere based on what you do. And so it's truly don't doesn't matter who you are or what skills you have. You got to go out and do it. And along the way, you're going to learn. Hey, Patrick, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. Oh, thanks, man. We're doing tea with closers, though, today. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I actually, I am more of a tea guy, by the way. I, skip, I, I, I quit coffee a little while ago. There you um, go. Because I was drinking too much of it uh, since the COVID. I, I even bought myself an espresso machine, and I realized this is a bad habit, uh, both on me, a wallet, and also your health. So I decided to just kind of uh, take a break from it. No, so tea, tea can help you, man. This is about 140 milligrams of tea of uh, caffeine in this thing right here. I got to tell you, Tiesta, you gave me that test, man. That was awesome. I had the tangerine flavor. It was really, really good. I would have Thank to say you. that was one of the best, one of the best teas that I've ever tasted. Appreciate it. So every entrepreneur has an interesting story of how they overcame obstacles to become an entrepreneur. I think you have something very similar to share. Um, you started your company with your preschool friend. Uh, and running this company for quite some time. So can you share with our audience a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started the company when I was 21 years old. Uh, today, I'm 34 years old, and we'll do around 11 million in sales uh, with about 25, 30 employees. Um, and I dropped out of college at the age of 21 to start the business. I, I started with my preschool best friend. Um, the whole idea is, honestly, when I was in college, Sam, I didn't I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wasn't a great student. Uh, most of the teachers kind of wrote me off as, as a troublemaker, a kid who couldn't pay attention or do well in school. Um, so I really was trying to find every any opportunity to leave school. I was looking for it. And we studied abroad and I found out that, you know, loose leaf tea is such a, it's very popular overseas. It's not something that you see much here in the U.S. And so my business partner, Dan, and I were drinking loose leaf tea as, and during our study abroad trip. And we said to ourselves, why aren't more Americans drinking, you know, tea? Tea wasn't cool. I mean, you're not going to name your show Tea with Closers. You <laughs> named it Coffee with Closers. Uh -huh. So we identified tea as kind of, it was this pinkies up type of category that had some um, some mystery, mystery and confusion. And so we wanted to create a brand that was just understandable, accessible, and affordable uh, and take kind of the, 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 the mystery out of tea. And so we launched as college seniors um, and started hitting the, hitting the pavement, going door to door, doing farmer's markets, and we've been able to make it work. Hmm. I think there's a Chicago uh, tea startup, too, that actually put tea on the radar for Starbucks. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, um, I think you're talking about um, Jamba Juice acquired them. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I remember who Talbot Teas. Was it Talbot Tea? There might be another one too. So, because I I don't think until twenty oh seven or so, where Starbucks was not even um, you know serving teas, and I think Starbucks was Starbucks Coffee, and they removed coffee from their name and then started offering tea. I think that's that's when Starbucks realized there's money to be made in the tea business. Um, yeah, so, they purchased uh, Tivana for like six hundred million in two thousand fourteen, yeah. and integrated Tivana into all of their cafes. We were actually the inspiration. One of the inspirations behind the brand mm -hmm. was because my mom took me to Tivana after we studied abroad. I bought a bunch of tea in Europe and I came, came back and, and I ran out and mm -hmm. uh, we said, all right, where do you go to get tea? And so mm -hmm. I had my mom take me to Tivana when I was 21 and she spent like a hundred bucks on tea and she was pissed. She's like, Patrick, we, we don't, we don't spend a hundred dollars on tea. So she's, she told me that was the last time she was ever going to buy me tea again. And so we identified an opportunity to, it didn't need to be like that. You don't need to spend a hundred bucks on good tea, uh, but they kind of make it so intimidating. You don't know what you're doing. You're willing to kind of, uh, you have no clue what you're doing. So you will pay that price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously you've accomplished a lot in your career. You built this company, you know, a college dropped out, built this company doing, you know, near 11 million in sales. Now for all the things you've learned, what's the biggest lesson you learned in the process? 
I mean, it just sounds so cliche, Sam, but, you know, growing up, everyone told me I couldn't do anything. I didn't, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I wasn't smart. My brother was the smart one. So what I learned was anyone can do anything if you really want to. Mm -hmm. Like, so stupid to say, it sounds so cliche, but if you really want it, just go do it. Like, stop talking, go do. And anything can be done. You, you know, I think one of the coolest things about entrepreneurship is watching people grow. You One day you may be, you know, a, a, a lower on the totem pole. And then 10 years later, you're, you're a king somewhere based on what you do. And so it's truly don't, it doesn't matter who you are or what skills you have. You got to go out and do it. And along the way, you're going to learn. You know, if you put your all into one thing every day for a year, don't you think something's going to good is going to come out of that? But if you don't do it, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. So there's no overnight success. People look at other people's success and they say, man, how did this guy do it in such a short time? But there's probably 10 years of real hard work and determination and, you know, sleepless nights that got them to where they are. Uh, so I'm sure you can share some of those of, you know, of all the, you know, accomplishments in your career, uh, especially in building this company, what's one, one accomplishment that kind of stand, you know, comes to mind? Um, you know, I think the, the, one of the coolest things was we did a, a 20 day door to door, um, I don't know what you want to call it. Sales excursion. We were, we were about to go out of business. We didn't have any money. We were doing about two, 3000 a month in revenue. Mm -hmm. And it's not, obviously not enough to pay anybody. Um, so our basis said, you know, we either, either got to get new customers or this might not work. And so mm -hmm. we identified that the way for us to get new customers was only going door to door. So we looked at our book of business and it's like, all right, how'd you get that door to door? How'd you get that door to door? So our advisors basically said, well, why don't you, uh, <laughs> why don't you go more door to door? And we're like, well, because we've already gone everywhere. Like, what do you mean? We've already done Chicago, all the suburbs, Milwaukee, Madison, Champaign. We've done everywhere. He's like, what about New York, Philadelphia, Vancouver, Seattle? He's like, you haven't gone anywhere. So we literally hopped in a car, went to New York, um, Philadelphia and then flew to Vancouver and Portland and Seattle. And we did uh, 500 doors in 20 days. Hmm. After that trip, uh, we, we were able to double our sales the next month and quadruple them a month after that. Hmm. So it really made a big, big difference for our business. And Sam, I think the reason why was because when you knock on 500 doors in 20 days, you're getting a PhD in sales. Mm -hmm. You're getting a, And you're getting a PhD in what you're selling. Because if I knock on 500 doors and 400 no's were because of this, well, you got to figure out how to fix that or why to fix that. If I knock on 500 doors and 20 of them are the same style, well, then I'm going to keep on knocking on those style of doors. So we learned who our customer was and we learned how to sell our product. And it was a it was a huge, huge, huge change for us because before that trip, Sam, I would knock on any door that had a door and a register. If you had a register and a door, I would knock on it. Because you can sell tea anywhere. You can sell it to the cafe, the restaurant, the fitness center, anywhere. But after that trip, we noticed that the place that was really uh, found value from our product was grocery stores. Because we offered loose leaf tea in a way that they hadn't, they couldn't offer their customers before. <clears throat> so we became the first loose leaf tea in the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And so once we realized that grocery stores were big for our product, we just started hitting the grocery stores hard. I think we're in like six or seven, 8,000 grocery stores today. Mm. So the door to door experience was, um, it was extremely rewarding. You know, you, and I'll never forget this, this, we, we lived in a house in Wrigley. Uh, my Dan, I'll never forget Dan's my business partner. And he basically said to me, he's like, dude, we're moving out of our parents' house. So how we don't have any money. He's like, well, we're going to have to figure out. He's like, we have, we have teeth. Mm -hmm. All right. So on the 15th of every month, he'd basically come to me and be like, all right, dude, got 900 bucks in the bank. Uh, rent's coming up in 10 days. So uh, I need you to go out and sell some tea. Yeah. So I'd get out there in the freezing cold and I'd knock on any door I could to try and make sure we hit rent. There was a couple of times I had to call, you know, tell my landlord, hey, dude. We're just a little bit behind. Um, give me a couple more days. And, and thankfully there were, you know, I think everybody, when you're starting a business and you show the true passion and the desire to work hard, if you tell your landlord, hey, I'm a, I'm a little late because I'm sorry, he's not going to kill you. Um, so he let us slide a couple times. 
Uh, but living in Wrigley and just going door to door to make it work, had we been living with our parents, I'm not sure we would have had that desire, right? It's like, instead of Dan calling me on the 15th saying, hey, we need, you know, a thousand bucks to pay rent, would have been like, all right, well, save your money because, you know, just go to your mom's and eat with her, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So taking the leap of faith, uh, going all in right away from the beginning. And um, that really helped, helped us. Yeah, that's an incredible story of, you know, doing the uncomfortable, doing the unscalable, right? And especially in the early days of getting this company started. I mean, it's got to be a monumental um, accomplishment for you to be at $11 million in sales and have 30 plus employees and being the co-founder of a company that's fast growing. And you have products on Amazon as well, right? So you have direct-to-consumers, you have retail uh, through uh, grocery chains, and also you're selling through Amazon. Correct. So obviously, you know, what is the compelling reason? Obviously, you went through so much hell and to get to where you are. What's the compelling reason why? Why do you keep doing this? Why do I keep doing it? Come on, man. What, what I don't know, see? Sam. I think uh, I've been given a world of opportunity from my, my family, and from my, my background. Um, my family immigrated here in the 1980s, um, and I was born in New York. and with that sense this comes you said this when we were chatting it comes this personal responsibility you know my um, my father was maybe one out of five million one out of ten million that was able to leave egypt with a, a a good job in hand he didn't come here and go work at the gas station he came here picked up in a limo and that's rare that's super rare and with that comes responsibility you know when i go back to my my family's country and i see the poverty out there and, and just how unfortunate they are uh it gives me this desire to to keep going and not just to keep going but to keep growing you know as a person it's easy to be complacent but when you see what you have and the opportunities that that god gives you or whoever you believe in gives you you can actually make change and you know for one for one we were able to build water wells for our farming community in nigeria Mm -hmm. and a lot of that comes from because i've seen what it's like for people not to have access to clean water and when you see that and you know that you have the opportunity to overcome it and i didn't do anything to be given this opportunity mm-hmm. i didn't it was just given to I, I fell into it right i i didn't work hard to be born in the united states of america i wasn't ambitious to be born here i was just born here and most people don't realize it you're the nine you're the, you're in the one percentile if you were just born in this country and because of that i have a desire to just to do great to to continue to succeed and, and, and never really be complacent, if you will. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about the running water, like just right now, you know, the, the Southwest Florida is going through so much turmoil uh, and they don't have the running water in some houses because they lost, you know, water lines, you know, major lines broken, things like that. But, you know, I think people, because in America, we turn on the tap, we have fresh water coming in, we have filters, we don't have to worry about it. But you know, if you haven't gone to other parts of the world, you don't understand just running water is a luxury in some parts of the world. Um, it's crazy to even imagine. So obviously, you know, um, talk to me about kind of the mindset. Obviously, you talk about like having to, you know, in the middle of the month, hey, we don't have enough money to go, you know, pay our rent. We have to go knock on doors to make the money. So what is that kind of mindset you've built to yourself to have uh, to, to achieve success? It's a good question. I think the mindset is um, you really have to be confident that you can overcome anything that's thrown at you. And honestly, like some of the challenges that you're going to face, a lot of them, they are going to be monetary, um, especially in the beginning. And, uh, and, and, and you have to be willing to accept short-term pain for the long-term gain and i know again it's super cliche but when when you have to whatever whether it's take out a hundred thousand dollar personal loan to pay off a bill because you know you're not getting paid in you know 60 days or uh, whatever it might be if you don't have that confidence and the ability to deal with the short-term pain and risk it's going to be very hard to, to succeed um, mm-hmm. so the mindset like you for me, it's like, all right, this is going to suck. Actually, this sucks. <laughs> no, this sucks, but I am the one who can get us out of this. I am the one who will get us out mm-hmm. of this. I can't rely on anybody. 
can't mm-hmm. rely on my, like maybe my partner. <clears throat> I can't rely on my nobody who's going to make it's me. It's all mm-hmm. on me. And when mm-hmm. you own your entire your success and your failure, if you fail, that's on you. If I'm if I fail and I'm waking up at eight o'clock in, in, in the morning, that's when I'm starting work. Then I, if I fail and I'm starting at four a.m., that's a different story. But I guarantee you, if I start at four a.m., I won't fail. <laughs> but if I start at eight a.m. and finish at five p.m., maybe I will fail. So it's on me to stay till six p.m. or seven p.m. So it's you. You have the control of your entire destiny right in your hands, right? You want to be rich? Then work. Right when you when you go home from work today, what are you gonna do? You can sit on your ass and watch TV, or you can try and build something. You you know, I it, it's that's truly what it is. Like, there's a lot of people who just they do their nine to five and they're cool with it. And being an entrepreneur, you yeah, you, just, you have a totally different mindset. But it's all on you. It's all on the person. And the success and the failure comes with it. You either succeed as as an individual with your team, of course, but you're the mm-hmm. one driving that shit. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like I think our society kind of teaches the importance of, you know, you know, the, the life, you know, work life balance and the importance of all of those things, which I, th- I do believe there is some validity to that. Right. You, you can burn out. Right. Because if you just work, 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 I'm sure you could burn out. But like you said, that 5 a.m. club, right, just waking up at 5 a.m. do and accomplish more before someone else wakes up by 8 a.m. Right. Like you got five hours or whatever, the time you have to go figure out who, who do I prospect to? Who do I sell to? What, what is my you know, strategy or learn a new skill in terms of how to sell better or how to market better? Those kind of things that actually would propel your business forward. That's where your know, opportunity is to, to succeed. But if you, if you binge watch you know, eight seasons of a whatever TV show, you lost time. And the time is the biggest asset that you have. You're going to lose the opportunity to succeed if, if that's what you're doing. Um, okay. Yeah. I've never watched. I don't know about you, but Game of Thrones. Never seen it. Um, I've never seen any of the shows. You can. I have no clue what. They, I don't watch that shit. I don't either. Funny, I'm not into funny. sports. I'm not into sports, and I'm not into any sort of uh, serial TV shows or anything like that. The only thing I would ever watch is like Discovery Channel for like any sort of like how it's been, how it's built. Um, so things like that that kind of inspires me to see how other companies do it, or how other industries do it. So you can try to see some strategies that other other companies have employed. Um, I'm so not obviously- quite there. Sports does take up some of my time. <laughs> Bull, as uh, you can see behind me, Chicago I can see sports. It. Um, I can see it. Well, you were in Wrigley yeah. well, so you actually had. Uh, what? I'm surprised you don't have any uh, White Sox. Uh, sorry, uh, Cubs in the background because even not though you're Cubs though. fan, not a huge Cubs fan. You know, they they uh, they the White Sox to me embody the hustle of the entrepreneur. Uh-huh. Their backs are always against the wall. No one roots for them. No one cheers for them. Everyone thinks they suck. But they go out and get it done, and so I, I have a a passion for the White Sox. Uh, yeah. They kind of they feel like they're the uh, underdog. The underdog. Exactly, that's for sure. So obviously, you said you were a college dropout. You had to learn business on your own. Had to go build it yourself, right? So you had to develop some of the personal skills as a leader, as a business, lead, you know, business person. How how are you continuing to invest in yourself, uh, building the personal skills that you need to to be an entrepreneur? So the, the most important thing that I invested in was, um, it's, it's mental, uh, mental, whatever it's the emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I invested in a, uh, it's a, a school, if you will, and called the Junto Institute. Mm-hmm. And basically it's, it helps you understand your emotional intelligence and, and the, 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 the good and the bad that come with being a business owner. Uh, I think it, it helped me surround myself with several other CEOs of businesses so that I'm always with, you know, once a month we would get together and explain our biggest problems. And I'll tell you what, Sam, you can call up, I can call up six of my best friends, put them in a room. Their problems won't be probably close to my problems, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's nice when you have a group of six CEOs and say, hey, I'm not sure how I'm going to hit payroll this week. Mm-hmm. I got a check that's coming in, but I don't know if it's going to come in in time for paper. What do you think I should do? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I have, I truly believe surrounding yourself with, uh, I was surrounded by another five or six like-minded CEOs in similar positions, growing businesses. Uh, that was really, really helpful for me. At the end of the day, if you don't vent or speak or talk about your challenges and problems, you are going to boil over and, and just lose yourself. 
uh, there needs to be a place for entrepreneurs to express their anger, their emotion, their desires, their their wins and their losses. Like you really, really need that as an entrepreneur. You cannot bottom it up. And so a lot of my <clears throat> trying to grow has been learning about the emotional intelligence, learning about how I'm feeling and, and how is that going to affect what I'm doing or or what I'm going to do tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then understanding and, and surrounding myself with people who are in similar shoes mm-hmm. so that I can tell them, hey, you know what? My wife hates when I work at seven o'clock. Does your wife have a problem with that? Here's what I do to combat that. Hey, um, you know, one of my employees has been super rude to me. What do you do mm-hmm. about that when that happens to you? And it's like, mm-hmm. If you don't have that group, it's lonely, man. It's so lonely. And so making sure I had that consistent group of um, people is, is is essential for my growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously they, you know, sharpen, not only sharpen your skill, but also challenge you to think outside the box, um, which I think is a big help. Yeah, because I think if you if you hang out with you know like you're the average of the five people you hang out with, right? So if you're hanging out with guys that are successful and you know thriving, so you learn from them and you also challenge yourself to improve your improve your own skills. Um, and so obviously, who has been the biggest influence on your leadership style? I wouldn't say I have like a a person that I, I try and take influence from. It's, I mean, I read the book. I read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So I guess you could say Dale Carnegie. Um, that book to me is my Bible. That's my Bible on on how to treat people and how to lead. So Dale Carnegie could be the answer, modern day uh, or past day. But then there's two other gentlemen. Um, one is Peter Rahal. He's the founder, co-founder of RX Bar. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter another Chicagoan, a, another Chicago. Yeah, successful exit too. He's such an awesome guy. He's he, he's so humble and so smart, but also so strong. Mm-hmm. And I love the way he, um, I love the way he leads, and and obviously it's led to some serious success. So mm-hmm. um, he's someone I really look up to. Yeah, maybe you can make an intro for me to have him on, on the show sometime in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, he's a, he's a tough cookie to get on the podcast. I know he's not the biggest fan of those being public either. Sometimes, yeah, I don't even think it was a big uh, like no one really knew they were a hustler too, right? Like a Chicago hustle story, like went door to door, went to all the mm-hmm. gyms and sold it. I mean, it's a crazy story of success, um, and it's always encouraging to hear what others have done to to get to where they are. And, and Pete, he's still super humble. Like you know, when I was I, I had lunch with him last year and. Same guy. When I text him or ask him for advice, he's always there for me. He's never used his success or an exit to put himself above me or anyone I know, which I admire truly. As a leader, you need that. Most certainly. So speaking of leadership, obviously, you know, as 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 founders, right, we kind of have to be the leader, right? You know, th- you know, coming up with the vision, you know, building the big, big uh, goal for the company and you know, get everybody excited about that. But then you also kind of need to be managing your team, right? Managing some of your uh, teammates. So which role do you tend to fall, fall into? Is there some sort of a mode that you all always operate out of? I like to operate as lead by example. Um, that's kind of my, you know, I won't ask you to do something that I haven't done or I wouldn't do myself. Um, I will get my hands dirty. I'll roll up my sleeves. I want to make sure you see that. I want to make sure my team knows that I'm willing to get my hands dirty. And the dirtier my hands, the dirtier their hands are going to be. But if I walk in and my hands are pristine clean, why should they get their hands dirty? So I, I believe in leading by example. Um, let me show you a success and then I'll teach you how I did it. And let me show you what, you know, and then, yeah, that's kind of how I roll. I'm not a good manager. It's not really my style. Yeah, and I think you know sometimes we you know we're hustlers, right? We're sometimes a little perfectionist too, so we can get in the weeds with you know somebody else's you know output and uh, get super critical. So that's why I try to shy away from that. Um, I don't know if you heard of HubSpot, um, one of the co-founders of HubSpot, Dharmesh Shah. You know one of the you know one of his requirements when he co-founded HubSpot was he wanted to have direct zero direct reports. Uh, he just said he didn't have the skill to be a manager, but he's the CTO. 
Um, but he was very deeply involved in the company and building the company culture code and all of those things. But he just never wanted to, uh, to be directly managing anybody. Now that company has over 7,000 employees and 2.5 billion in revenue. And he's no zero, way. He has zero, zero direct reports. Um, but I think he, he saw his weakness. He knew what his weakness was. And he said, I just not cut out for managing people. So don't do you know those guys? Uh, we're a HubSpot partner. So we early days, we had much more accessibility to the leadership. Not anymore. They're at a, at a completely uh, crazy level. Um, but crazy story though, they're, they're own, you know, they started in 2007. So probably about wow. 17 years and 2.5 billion in revenue. I think market cap is like $25 billion. So that's a different breed when you're in the software business. So it's not the same as, you know, building a tea company, right? So you have raw materials, you have, you know, warehousing, you have distribution, you have all of those hard costs of actually operating a company. It's not the same as you have an Amazon web services and, you know, build a software and try to figure out how you make, you know, a thousand people to buy it and uh, charge a monthly subscription for it. So that's a completely different, different business model. So obviously, how has your approach on sales and marketing evolved? Obviously, you had to do knock on doors. You had to do the hustle way. How has that approach changed now that you're, you know, inching toward, you know, probably close to 12 million in sales? I would say at this point, it's like you really, in order to fuel more sales, like you, you can't do it without marketing. Mm-hmm. You know, I almost, I, I, I had to tell my business partner last year, like, man, I, I don't want to sell to any more retailers or distributors or chains. Like we need, mm-hmm. to, we need to, to sell, we need to create demand through the good consumers first and then it's create the demand through the retailers. So in the beginning, I mean, we started, I'd call it like brute force sales, brute force sales, sell to anyone and everyone. And now it's, uh, it's a, definitely a lot more on the marketing front. Um, it's it, when you brute force sales, you're, um, you're not always sure that there's a, customer at the end of the day right it's easy to get in the store but can you get off the store shelves and that's where marketing comes into play and i think nowadays i mean with all the different social media outlets if you're if you're not putting marketing in front of sales you may be making that uh, mistake Uh, because if you're doing marketing right it will drive sales now you have to make sure the sales are already there like the distribution points and all that but once you're there, it's all marketing that's going to drive it. Look at yesterday. It was a company that um, announced a 700. they it's called Liquid Death. It's a water company. They put water in a beer can, and they're all about like really edgy marketing. On their, they put you know one of their things was they had uh, they were signing autograph posters with T- Tony Hawk the skater mm-hmm. with his blood. Mm-hmm. And so they do crazy. They just raised its seven hundred million dollar valuation. Mm. It's a year old, two years old for water. Old, for water, and it's water huh. in a beer can. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of them? No, I have not. Oh, check them out. Liquid that, and it's all marketing. Mm-hmm. So you know, in my opinion, sales sales can't be exponential the way marketing can. Mm-hmm. Like marketing, you can truly exponentially grow your business if you hit something right on the marketing side. Mm-hmm. Sales, it's like building brick by brick. Yeah, and it's also one to many, right? So marketing is more of a one to many strategy, where sales is more of a one to one strategy. Uh, when you talk right. about the 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 scalability of it, um, so in that sense, like obviously, when you're in the early days, did you raise capital or was completely self funded? Yeah, your company. We 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 raised a lot of capital. Um, we but when we were in college, we had no money, so it started on like a fifteen hundred dollar credit card, and then we were able to get some angel investors to help us. Um, get our feet off the ground, and then we did some, you know, st- traditional Series A, Series B, and all that. We raised, I think, eight or nine million to date. And obviously, as a as a business leader, you have a lot of strategic decisions to make. You have a lot of you know pressing priorities to deal with. Is there some sort of a decision making framework that you follow uh, in terms of how you you know how you make critical decisions? You know, I was actually thinking about that yesterday. One of the biggest mistakes I made was mm-hmm. for not following our mission. Mm-hmm. Um, and acting against our mission. Mm-hmm. So our mission is to make under loose leaf tea understandable, accessible, and affordable. Mm-hmm. Then in 2018, I was approached by Target, the retailer, to launch a bottled tea. Um, so completely against making loose leaf tea understandable, accessible, affordable. But they dangled the carrot over my head. Um, they told me they were going to put me in 1,700 stores. 
five flavors, January 1st rollout for the year. You get really excited and say, all right, forget about this. And so since then, it truly has been going back to, if it doesn't help us make loose leaf tea understandable, accessible, and affordable, then we don't want to do it. If it helps us make loose leaf tea understandable, accessible, and affordable, then we'll do it. Mm -hmm. And so using our mission to drive our decisions is, it sounds, again, super cliche, Mm -hmm. um, but it can help you put framework to your decision making. Yeah. I mean, I think it will help you at least um, eliminate the bad choices, right? And like, hey, this doesn't, this is clearly against our mission. So we don't want to pursue that. Um, I think that's that's a great way to do it. So I'm sure you have a lot of things to get done throughout your day, right? Prioritizing tasks and getting things done. Is there some sort of a productivity hack that you follow? My favorite productivity hack is just email pausing. Uh, Sometimes I get in the habit of refreshing my inbox, you know, see in my inbox, will make me reactive, not proactive. But then when I pause my inbox, it makes me extremely, extremely proactive. So I'll pause it, I can still use it, I can still look at it. Uh, I have a, a, a plugin that I use, and just lets me focus. I've got really bad ADHD, so um, pausing my inbox is like the number one way. And I, I'll do it, I'll pause my inbox from about 10 o'clock to two o'clock every day. It's pause, and my team knows, uh, mm-hmm. my, my, main, my main people know. So if they need me, they can hit me up on Slack, but I don't like to, you get stuck in the email for, for hours. Um, mm. So just yeah. pause in that. Email, email can really distract you, right? That it, t- it can take you away from, you know, the, your most important things that you should be focused on. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're, I always think of email as somebody else's to-do list for you, right? Like they're telling you what to do, giving you, <laughs> giving you to-dos. That's how I perceive it. So you've, you've probably learned a lot in, over the years of, you know, doing all this. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? I, would, I wish I could just would have done it earlier. I wish I could have started building earlier. Um, experience is, you can't get experience if you don't do it. <laughs> so a lot of people say, well, you're too young. You don't have experience. Well, what do you mean? Like one of my buddies, he he uh, he started working his career when he was 18. He didn't go to college. I did go to college. I dropped out. But he started his, um, he worked in, in mortgage lending and he started at 18. And man, where he's at today is at such a high level because he started, he had four year head start. And I'm not saying to go drop out of college, but college just wasn't for me. I was there because society told me to be there. I was there because my father has a PhD. I wasn't there because I was learning anything. I wasn't learning anything. I wasn't, I was literally just wasting time and money. Mm-hmm. And the minute I left school and just, and, it, and you know, I only have 30 hours left, so I could graduate, but this company gave me the opportunity to kind of run without turning my head. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, all right, I'm going to do this tea business. Thank you, college. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. Maybe next time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wish I would have started my tea business when I was 18. Mm-hmm. not 21 the difference between 18 and 21 there's not much but those three years to give you that head start it's mm-hmm. huge you know sam you know how it's hard to start a business when you're 30 years old mm-hmm. i believe it's a lot harder when you're 30 than when you're 21 and the reason why is because of the responsibilities you have you know when you're 21 eating ramen every day is fine but when you're 30 you may have a house, you may have a wife, you may have kids, your friends are getting married, you've got baby showers, you've got your parents you have to take care of, you've got your siblings, whatever. When you're 21, 18, you got nothing. <laughs> Literally nothing. So I just wish I would have started sooner. Would that be the advice you give your younger self? If you had to give your younger self an advice? Yeah, it would be because everybody told me I was going to be a failure. Everybody mm-hmm. in school, even my parents, because I didn't get good grades. So from, you know, the age of like 12 to 18, I always thought, man, I'm just an idiot, Mm -hmm. just a moron. That's what everybody tells me. My report cards are, you know, people laugh at me because I can't get a good grade on my report card. And so I didn't think I had, society didn't make me feel like I had Mm -hmm. what it took to to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And so they tell you, you need your degree to be successful. Wow. I mean, it's an incredible story of success, an American, American dream in the making. So I appreciate you, Patrick, joining me today and sharing Thank your you. life experience and your lesson. And I'm sure this is going to be very encouraging for other audiences uh, that are listening to this. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure.
This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.